Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back again to another episode of As I Live and Grieve. But we've covered so many subjects in the almost three years that this podcast has been going. We've reached many, many people. And again, we're in 90 countries plus around the world. Since there are really only 150 countries, I think, you know, we've got the lion's share of the entire earth. So I appreciate each and every one of my listeners. Every so often, I try to find an area that I really haven't been able to focus on, primarily because I haven't really found a guest that either is available and or I feel comfortable really has a sense to talk about a specific topic. So with me today is John Anderson, or is it John David Anderson? You tell me and tell our listeners. (laughs) You can actually just call me Dave. That's fine. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Dave, would you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so my full name is John David Anderson. That's that's what's on the cover of all of my books. I'm a middle grade author, uh, which means that I write books primarily for teens and tweens between the ages of like eight and 14. I've published 14 novels now at this point, but several of them have to do with the grieving process or questions of legacy or loss and memory and those kinds of things. I've been published since I was 30. I've been writing seriously since I was 17. I've been telling stories since I was three years old and started lying to my parents to get out of trouble, you know, Um, (laughs) and I am a firm believer in the power of storytelling. I think that's what motivates me to do what I do. I think one of the greatest things that storytelling does is it creates empathy, which is, of course, something that, you know, we'll probably touch on later in this conversation. Other than that, I live in Indianapolis, Indiana with my wife. I have two college-age children, two brand new kittens. So if you do hear meowing or scratching in the background, you know what to attribute that to. And it's not the children trying to get in your office, okay? No, it is not. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, I first ran across your book, Ms. Bixby's Last Day, and I was really touched by the plot of that book and everything and how gently, really, it touched on grief. It wasn't an in-your-face issue. You know, to me, it just felt very gentle, and I thought, what a great book to give your tween, your And you already answered one of my questions with your age group between 8 and 14, because it would introduce them to the topic and certainly give you ample room for discussion to sit down with them and talk about it or read the book with them. I thought that was great. And then as you and I got talking a bit, you mentioned your other books and I picked up Finding Orion. And I have to tell you, the only constellation I can pick out in the sky is Orion's belt. Mm -hmm. So Finding Orion had special meaning to me. But then when I saw how you kind of touched on grief in this book, and you know, the listeners know me well enough to know that my sense of humor is on point most of the time. And even at the memorial service for my husband, one of his good friends came to the podium to say a few words about him, set down a paper cup of Tim Horton's coffee on the podium. And at my husband's memorial service, I dissolved in laughter, (laughs) which quickly turned to sobbing, I admit. But the laughter was because my husband had to have his cup of Tim Horton's coffee every single day, or he was not happy. So the entire time he was in the facility, every day I would take him his coffee. And even when he got to the point, he had a brain tumor, even when he got to the point where he couldn't swallow anymore, his, his swallowing reflex wasn't working, so they were giving him thickened liquids and everything. He mm. couldn't have his coffee, but I'll be darned if he did not force down several swallows a day of his Tim Horton's coffee before he would start choking, and then the nurses would come. But he had to have that coffee. So humor yeah. is great. So when I saw this book, again, targeted for the 8- to 14-year-olds, and This Norman Rockwell family, well, all right, so they're a little quirky. Um, They have jelly beans for appetizers, which I loved. But when they responded to a knock on the door, and it was a clown, 
with a telegram or a singing telegram or whatever that constituted words like, ooh, Papa Quirk, he made life grand. He laughed big laughs. He made big plans. By all accounts, a superman. But Papa Quirk has kicked the can. I thought, what? (laughs) And then I thought again, what a great way to introduce grief, death of someone you care about, to tweens. It will get them laughing. It will loosen them up and hopefully start them talking. So how did you, Dave, come across these concepts? Was it in working with your own kids? You know, it it all comes from various places, obviously, uh, the sources of your inspiration. It's hard to pinpoint, you know, just any one thing. I know with Miss, Miss Bixby's last day, uh, my wife was a teacher, my mother was a teacher, you know, so I've been surrounded by teachers. And when you think about your relationship with teachers, I mean, this is somebody who's very important in your life, like incredibly important yes. for, one, for one year, right? Yes. And then after that, you move on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And so you take that, that process, building a relationship and creating those memories, mm-hmm. and you condense it down to this very finite point of time. And so then it becomes sort of a microcosm for all the relationships that we create in our life. Right. right? And so it's easy for me to think in terms of grief and in terms of processing legacy and the impact that somebody's had, it's really easy to think of that in terms of a teacher, right? Because, you know, you think about your parents and both of my parents have passed away not too long ago and there's so much baggage, right? That's associated uh, yes, with that. Yes. Uh, it w- yeah. It would take 50 novels to unpack it, but you can unpack what a teacher meant to you in one book, right. yeah. you know, and then, so when you couple that with, you know, Miss Bixby has stage four pancreatic cancer. She has to leave the school year early. She is in the hospital and these three boys that she's had this tremendous impact on, they decide they're going to skip school and break her out mm-hmm. of the hospital and just give her that last day party that teachers are supposed right. to get, you know? Right. And so then what they can do is they can go through the process accessing and understanding what she means to them over the course of a day. Right. Right. Which for us, you know, when we've lost somebody, this is a process that takes years. Sure. But that's what I wanted to do. Like take a teacher so you can take that whole relationship down Mm -hmm. and then take that process of going on that journey. What did you mean to me? And really just have it hyper-focused, you know, on that one day. Now, the other book that you mentioned, Finding Ryan, (laughs) Yeah, that kind of takes a different tack. I uh, love it, though. I love it. Yeah. And when you mentioned um, your <laughs> husband and Tim Hortons, yes. I was just thinking uh, about a third of the way through that book, they go to the funeral, right? Because mm-hmm. you, can't, you can't spell funeral okay. without fun. And without giving too much away to listeners, there's taco trucks and marching bands and mm-hmm. Elvis impersonators and mm-hmm. you, you name it, right? It is a shindig, to be sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and part of that, of course, was Papa Quirk, and part of that is a function of the plot. But part of that is exactly what you're talking about. We use humor right. not just as a defense mechanism, I think, although it, we do do that. But there's something terribly absurd, you know, about death, right? Absolutely. Um, when you think about it, like, why does it even have to happen? Why do our bodies deteriorate, mm-hmm. you know, all these things? Why is that always, you know the end of every story that's ever told, right? Because right. it has to be. Right. And I think especially if you're a tween or mm-hmm. a young person, a teenager, yeah. and you're invincible because we all know that Absolutely. all are. Right? I have made that same expression. I have associated that exact word with many tweens and teens I know. The, at, this is the reason they do some of the stupid things they do because they're invincible and uh, immortal. And uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I I will give them a little credit for their morality, but yeah. uh, I, I, w- I will say their foolishness stems from, yeah, it's that the, the invincible aura. Sure. And so to them, death has to be even more absurd, like even more co- incomprehensible. Right. You know, pushing 50. I can start to imagine it, right? Like, eh, you know, I can see that coming. But when I was 12, I definitely did not. So then when it comes, you have to deal not only with, the permanence of it, right, mm-hmm. uh, which is shocking, but yeah, just also the absurdity of it. And so that's how I approached that novel, right, uh, yeah. with 
to take that to the humor to the extreme right. uh, and then pull it back. Right. So that they did come to grips with their very true feelings because you can't just laugh at it forever. Right? No, no. That's As you right. say, you, you have to laugh until you start sobbing. Exactly. Uh, so you, that you get the release. But I guarantee that were everything in this book to come true, decades later, the family will have happy memories of Papa Quirk more than if it had been a very traditional, somber funeral. And when we started this podcast, my daughter and I said, we just want to make grief an easier topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. So when we find something like your books, the books you've written, that really fits our mission, if you will, because by reading this book, it does make it easier because you can laugh about it. You read it. Yes, it's absurd to think that somebody would put on a funeral like this. However, there is a trend around the world now to have different types of funerals. We've already gotten away from some of the traditional ones by having memorial services separate from the funeral home. The family may be the ones to attend the burial or placing the urn with ashes somewhere special or scattering ashes, but you have a memorial service. I remember years ago going to a funeral for a young child who actually fell into a well and drowned. And it was just so, so tragic. Yet the funeral was a celebration of this young boy's life. And I left there feeling fulfilled and happy. So I really like to celebrate the fact that this is kind of trending now, mm. where we are celebrating the lives people have lived and the memories that they're leaving with us. And many times families are turning these memories into a legacy. Many, many of our guests have started a legacy. You yourself in many ways have a legacy because you have these books. So do you have any thoughts on what might be a challenge when you're dealing with that age group, the tweens, the early teens, as far as broaching the topic of grief. If you were to have a loss in your family, I mean, you said recently your parents died. I'm, I'm guessing a clown didn't come to your door <laughs> announcing that. Okay. How did you broach that with your kids? Do you mind talking about that? No. And it was different. You know, my father had cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. And so his was a long, you know, battle Obviously, there were lots of treatments involved, right. uh, and so that was multiple conversations. Right? Sure. And when it's when it's that case, when you can see something coming, and even when you see quality of life start to deteriorate, then that puts you in a different position, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To talk about legacy because it's something that I mean, we could even talk about it with him, right? Sure. At the time, and there's. There's this line in Miss Bixby's Last Day, which says, you know, may all your days be carnation days, right? Oh. Um, mm -hmm. those, mm -hmm. those little memories right. uh, that you make, right? They're not all going to be roses. They're not all going to be these like special boom ba, right? Yeah. Uh, explosions. So you're going to have a few of those. But most sure. of your days with somebody, right? They're going to be pretty good days, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and you want to remember the pretty good days. And right. when, when my father was nearing the end, like if you got a, a a decent day, mm -hmm. right, where he wasn't in too much pain and he could go out and, you know, take right. a walk mm -hmm. or something like that, then you counted yourself lucky. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's how I approached it with my, with my children at the time was thinking, you know, well, make the most of the time, obviously, that we have together. Let's carpe this diem. Right? Sure. And then, you know, that will help us to solidify these memories as we're making them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My mother passed away a little over a year later when the pandemic started okay. and it was completely sudden and unexpected. And that was a much harder conversation to have. Right. Uh, and it's one that I think even now, a couple of years later, you know, I'm still having with myself, mm -hmm. with family. Yes. Because there's just more questions. Right? Sure there are. There's yeah. existential questions mm -hmm. and there wasn't the time to 
ask and answer those beforehand. So now you have to answer them after the fact. And I think that's harder. And so I think for that reason, one of the things I would just stress, you know, any parent to do is have the conversation before you have to have the conversation, which is to say, you know, make sure your children understand a little bit about the inevitability of these things Mm -hmm. and that they then use that as a benchmark for appreciating and assessing their own life and their relationships and their experiences with you and their friends and everything around them. You know, we can't all Mm -hmm. seize the day every day. There's, you know, we don't have the energy for that. Right. And often perspective. Right. And often we don't realize that a day was good until it's already passed. Right. Exactly. When you have something else to compare it to, you know, now instead of as a parent, as a teacher, if you know that a student in your class has suffered a loss in his family, and let's just assume for the moment that it was an unanticipated loss, Mm -hmm. maybe a heart attack or a car accident or something. Do you have any thoughts about how a teacher might handle the situation? Well, my wife was the public school teacher. I only taught college. Okay. Um, And so I will say the advantage to that is, you know, we had uh, great aunts dying right and left from college students who wanted to get out of their test. Like, like, didn't your great aunt pass away three times already? It's a big family. Yeah, it was a big family. Extended family. And so it's, I mean, my perspective would be a little bit different, but just having, you know, been exposed to that world and that environment for so long, it is amazing how, and this could be a bit of a a, a diatribe, but how we expect teachers and how they are then second Mm -hmm. parents, right? Right. Uh, Right. And they are. Teachers have become second parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, They have all these extra responsibilities. And, you know, I have never met a teacher that would sort of push that away and say, no, that's Mm -hmm. not my, that's not my foray. I'm not going to help you deal with your grief. Of course they are. Right. And so for me thinking about it, like what I would want a teacher to do would just, yeah, obviously you need to be empathetic. And we Mm -hmm. talked about that at at the start Mm -hmm. Uh, because you're an adult, right? You've experienced this, whereas this kid may be experiencing it for the very first time. Sure. Right? Sure. And so you use that experience to build that empathy with your students. And then if there's any way to do it, try to create empathy in the classroom as well, mm-hmm. you know, so that without obviously singling the kid out, right. Or making them a target or mm-hmm. uh, guess what happened to Jimmy yesterday. <laughs> yes. Uh, like, <laughs> right. Got an ice cream cone. No, it's worse than that. Then you know, allow a community to build, right? Right. Because we all need support networks. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and here's an ingrained one, right? Here's mm-hmm. one that you go to seven hours a day, five days a week. Right. Uh, they might as well be there for you. Right. Right. And I honestly think, I mean, yes, you can take your toddler for a walk and you can find a a dead earthworm on the sidewalk (laughs) after the rain has dried up and everything. And you can have a conversation about how that worm has died and all living things must die. And and the toddlers, "Mm, ice cream, ice cream, you know, because (laughs) they have that very short attention span. But obviously with tweens and young teens, it needs to be dealt with a little differently. They're going to have a lot of questions, questions that you may not even believe have entered their brain. Mm -hmm. And it may not so much be, well, what happens after you die? Although that's probably one of the most common. What happens? And then you've got this entire thing about, well, what's our belief system? What do we, you know, what do you believe? So you can, as a parent... And I'm not saying this is a teacher's place because it's not. It starts with the parents. You can have different conversations about that. And you can even say, I honestly don't know. Because theoretically, once someone's gone, we don't hear from them again. However, there are people out there that believe they do hear. And you can just imagine. And one thing I loved as a parent was having discussions like this with my tweens and early teens because it was actually a conversation. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me spitting out a sentence about a dead earthworm and then having the child distracted, not want to talk about it anymore. It was actually hearing what my child was thinking. 
that became so important to me as a parent. And we were able to have some really incredible discussions. I was very honest with them. I said, this is what I believe. Yeah. But this is how I was brought up. Right. You were brought up a little differently. We didn't go to church every Sunday when I was raising my girls. So their belief system was and is different. Yeah. They have to form their own beliefs and everything. So all I did was just open the world, if you will. And of course, now with the internet, you can Google anything you want. And now with chat bots, which I just discovered this past weekend, <laughs> you, I mean, it blew my mind. But now you can actually aid your child in the discovery process Yeah, and stay involved with them. And I just think that is such a rewarding aspect as a parent that you're able to do that. And what I like about what you said, and I think this is really important, especially with young people as they're creating their own belief systems, right? And they're, you know, sort of researching dogma and putting that, pitching exactly. that against the things that have happened in their life is that there's a difference between, you know, there is an answer and this is the answer, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've always pushed my kids to say, there is an answer. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know it. I'm still figuring it out for myself. Right. You'll figure it out for yourself. I right. do believe, right, that there is purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Um, I wouldn't yeah. be an author if I didn't. Right. Right. Because this right. is what we do as storytellers. We try to Absol find purpose yeah. and meaning. Definitely. You know? yeah. But I'm not going to prescribe that for you. What I'm going to do is equip you with the tools that you exactly. need. Exactly. Yeah. To ask the right questions. Uh huh. So that you can mess with all these messy feelings, right? Yep. And mold them into yep. a belief system of your yep. own that makes you feel better right. about all the stuff that's happening to you. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And one of the things I, you know, I really, really stressed with my kids is that regardless of what scientifically, biologically, physiologically happens to a body and whatever theoretically happens to a soul after <laughs> death, what we can do while we still live is keep their memory alive. Yes. Remember their names. Remember the things that made us laugh and smile about them. Remember the Tim Hortons coffee. Mm -hmm. Remember every time I see a bottle of hot sauce, I think of Tom because he always challenged himself to find the hottest hot sauce on the face of the earth. I don't think he ever succeeded, but I do know that when I was cleaning things out before I moved after he died, I probably wound up throwing away far more than a hundred bottles of hot sauce that had expired. You know, his <laughs> yeah. bottles of hot sauce became an art exhibit for us on a shelf unit with all the fancy labels. It was really very striking for an art exhibit. But it's those memories that when when I think of them, it makes me smile or a friend of his may mention or they will all of a sudden just bring me a cup of Tim Hortons coffee now. And we both dissolve in laughter. Mm -hmm. It's those memories that will keep those people alive for you, regardless of what has happened to them. But yeah, it's grief is difficult to talk about regardless of age. It's uh, when I started the podcast, I think most sessions I had tissues nearby because it was hard for me. Uh -huh. But the podcast and talking with different people like yourself, Dave, it's, it's helped me heal too. And that's why I continue to do it. I will grieve for the rest of my life. And I've lost not only Tom, my husband, I've lost an infant son who was less than 24 hours when he died. And I've lost both parents. Mm -hmm. Um, I joke with my brother and say, I've not lost a sibling and you're the only one I've got. So you have to <laughs> let me go first because, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to grieve anymore, but to be able to talk about grief makes it easier to accept because you know that at some point in life, you're going to be in grief. Yeah. And we talk about grief is just as essential, I think, as part of life just as an important part of life as the dying process itself, because it helps us continue to grow as humans. And I know that today, five and a half years after Thomas died, I'm really a different person than mm -hmm. I was before he died. But I have to say, I really like the person I am now. I like who I've become and I'm happy with that. And I hope that my legacy, the things I'm doing now, like this podcast and mm -hmm. some of the other things I'm working on. I'm working on a book and a couple other projects, but uh, 
those things I hope are what will be in the memories of the people that I leave behind when it's my turn. So, you know, again, your books real quick, and then I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Um, but your books, I think, make it easier for parents to open that discussion with their tweens and their teens. Again, it's an area that there are tons of books for toddlers and kindergartners and elementary school kids, but there are few books for the young adult group. So thank you, thank you, thank you for creating those books. Well, thank you. All right, now we're winding down and I'm actually gonna say, Dave, this is your turn. The microphone is all yours. All right, Uh, well, I just wanna say two things. One, just piggybacking on what you said. Uh, Obviously the conversation is, it's the most important thing, right? That sort of face-to-face, one-to-one. But reading a book is also a conversation, right? Uh, Just as writing a book is one. And Mm -hmm. I I won't lie, writing several of my books has been for me, a personal journey of coping with, you know, the same emotions that those characters are coping with. And so the books that we mentioned, like Miss Bixby's Last Day or Finding Orion, or even my latest one, The Greatest Kid in the World, they're me still grieving, but grieving through storytelling. Mm -hmm. And so if you do have a kid who's not real hip on conversation, right? Like Mm -hmm. the actual give and take uh, of exchanging words. Right but wants to grapple with these things, I think books are a great way into that. And so I would say, you know, and it doesn't have to be my book, obviously, but any book that speaks to them, right, that at least allows them to start to ask those questions and maybe find answers is going to be valuable, right? So uh, this is, I mean, it's a plug in one way for yay, books and literature are great things, but they're just extensions of the conversations that we want to have. With that in mind, I will say that there there are any teachers out there, educators, librarians that, you know, are interested in broaching this topic with their classrooms and want to pick out one of these books or any of my books that deal with these things that I am ready and available to come in and have a Skype or a Zoom just to sort of video q a i'm easy to reach you can find me at john david anderson author right on the internet or john david anderson author at gmail and you know i'd love to be able to as we say have this conversation with the young people directly as opposed to just having the conversation with them through my novels yeah well again dave you know i'm going to say thank you probably 1900 times (laughs) but there are several times a year that i will actually purchase books from some of my guests on the podcast and I donate them various places. So some of your books will be going out to some teachers in the area that I know. It's a great book to have on hand should you encounter this situation. And again, we see more and more in the news about tragedy striking our school kids, that age group, the students themselves, whether it's a friend or a loved one of a fellow student. So I think more and more teachers are going to feel the need coming up to kind of broach the subject at some point, because in broaching the subject and at least opening the discussion, it's the it's one of the ways and probably maybe the easiest way to help our kids cope with this disaster that at some point is going to hit their lives. Yeah. And, you know, whether they're elementary school or young adults or whatever, we have to be open as adults and let the kids know that there's no topic that they cannot discuss with us, even the ones that hurt. So I highly recommend your books to everyone I know. Again, I do get asked for recommendations and this age group is a tough one, but it's not tough anymore for me to recommend books. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time to come on and chat about it because again, it's an area that I feel we've kind of uh, soft peddled maybe over the last few years. It's difficult to find people that are comfortable talking. Sometimes it's difficult to find people that are comfortable talking about this age group Mm -hmm. because we all know that this, this age group, they're starting to form their belief system for their own adult hood and they don't know what they want to believe right and sometimes they don't even know how to ask somebody what do you believe they're just not comfortable talking about things 
So anything we can do as adults, as parents, as aunts and uncles, as grandma, Mm -hmm. grandpa, anything we can do to open that discussion for these kids is going to pay off big time. It is going to pay off for them. It's going to pay off for future generations right? because they are going to remember the day that grandma sat down and we talked about (laughs) death. I guarantee it. I just guarantee it. That being said, I've actually run over a bit. I don't care. I don't care. This (laughs) This was great conversation. You are a phenomenal guest, a great author. I hope our teachers out there that might be listening just kind of take you up on your offer to Zoom to talk with these kids because I think it would be an experience the kids would really value as well. And for some reason, Dave, I know that you probably get as much out of it as the kids do. Oh, absolutely. I'm yeah. just guessing. We're all still learning. Yeah, absolutely. So on that note, listeners, thanks again for tuning in. We'll catch you again next week. Again, thanks so much, Dave. His contact information will be in the episode notes, and I hope you reach out to him. I hope you go buy a book or seven. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Buy one of each. Yeah. Christmas is coming great gifts books. I always say that. So take care and we'll catch you again as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.